Many calls are responded to and provided with appropriate uh, intervention over the phone and resolved there. Other times we dispatch a mobile crisis team. We have crisis beds available for short-term crisis stay, recovery and wellness activities, training and education offered to the community, and a multitude of operations. We don't do this work alone. And I cannot value enough the, the collaboration, the coordination, and the service pathways that we create with many across the city, from you know youth agencies, agencies serving seniors, case management and service navigation through the access point, and uh, services that are led by people with lived experience and focused on, on serving that community from sound times to the empowerment council at CAMH. Can I grab the next slide? Ah, yeah, there we go. So, Gerstein Center is doing a whole lot. All of our services are 24-7 and serving people living with mental health and substance use needs. We have uh, a substance, in addition to the, to the regular crisis service, calling the 24-7 crisis line, mobile teams, and uh, house stays. We have a dedicated yeah. substance use team supporting people in crisis involving substance, who are involved with substance use and providing follow-up support up to 30 days. We also have some crisis beds that are located at the Positive Withdrawal Management uh, Center as well. We have another program at Gerstein on board with 14 beds serving people with mental health needs who are homeless and may have some involvement, current involvement with the justice system. And we have five beds that are allotted for people who identify as female who are homeless and also living with mental health and substance use needs. The 911 co-location project is fairly new and interesting. We have a crisis group that will up at the 911 call center. Uh, calls that come in for somebody experiencing a mental health crisis can be diverted directly to our crisis worker. Once that line is switched over, that person is receiving confidential services through Gersey Crisis Center, no longer on tape with the police, and that call becomes part of you know, their a response between our service and them potential to dispatch the Toronto Community Crisis uh, Service across uh, across all anchors in the city. We have two neighborhood outreach teams in the Moss Park and Church Wellesley area serving communities there. Our team is literally on the ground eight hours a day walking the streets, checking in with folks on the streets, stopping by businesses and residences and offering support. All of our services are really geared toward individual needs and aimed at diverting people away from unnecessary involvement with police and emergency departments. We also sit in a couple of uh, what are known as focus situation tables. So these are tables organized through uh, the Toronto Police Service um, uh, and United Way, that's the other partner, and intended to serve people who are at acute and elevated risk of being criminalized themselves or criminalizing others primarily because they're living with mental health and substance use needs. Gerstein is a, a, a front responder for those calls as well. So the next slide will give you a sense of our catchment area. I get the next slide. It's just, it's just a map showing where our, our Gerstein's mobile team goes. We run quite the uh, wide gamut of the city from Jane to Victoria Park, and from the lake all the way to most parts of Edmonton. Next slide. Take that and the one following. So the Toronto Community Crisis Service. I'll show you the next slide, which gives you a sense of where we're, we're situated. There are four anchor partners serving about 60% of the city. CMHA is in the northwest, serving police divisions 23 and 31. In the northeast, we have Tai Lu ser uh, that serves 41, 42, and 43 divisions. Two spirited peoples of the First Nation are in the downtown west. They're in 14 division and really focus on serving community members who identify as an Indigenous and would like an Indigenous-specific response. And Gerstein Crisis Centre is also located in the downtown east, serving the divisions uh, 51 and 52 that runs roughly between Spadina and the Don Valley, and again, the lake to Bloor Street. And we'll get to the next slide. There we are. So what is the Toronto Community Crisis Service? Calling 211, calling 911, or calling Gerstein Crisis Centre 
it is a dispatch model. People call it a crisis, and teams are dispatched to roughly 60% of the city. It is a City of Toronto partnered and funded uh, pilot project. It is 24-7. It is voluntary and consent-based, serving individuals 16 and over. We are a trauma-informed care response with harm reduction modalities. It is a no-wrong-door approach with multiple access points and mobile crisis teams. We offer post-crisis follow-up and crisis management and service navigation for up to 90 days. And we have um, referrals to culturally relevant services and referral networks. We'll wait for the next slide. The next slide really is just, you know, I'll, I'll just keep talking. It's a high-level service map that really shows the access points to 211-911 or Gerstein. Uh, any of which can dispatch the Toronto Community Crisis Service mo mobile team. We go out, we see people initially, provide crisis intervention, really see what people need in the moment from their experience and from what they're telling us they need. We, we send uh, the people in crisis uh, are, are at the center of everything that we do, so listening to what they need, listening to what they want in the moment. And then we come back in a couple of days to see how they're doing. We, and from that point, we can offer up to 90 days of follow-up in the community and referrals uh, and accompaniments to, the, to other programs and projects that might be of value. So key features, some of which I've said already, again, I will say that we provide uh, a community-based, non-medical and trauma-informed approach using harm reduction um, tools to provide crisis intervention that respects individuals' ability to define their own identities, experience, crisis, and goals. Un unneeded interactions with police and hospital and emergency departments are avoided whenever possible. It is a key feature of our service to provide community-based crisis intervention and to provide an option that moves people away from an unnecessarily police or hospital one. Kirsten Center has highly skilled and ex experienced community crisis workers with a broad range of experience and education who are hired with intention to reflect the diversity of the communities we serve. We also remain guided by the voices of people with lived experience who advise and work within all levels of the organization. We are committed to hiring a minimum of 30% of all of our employees from our frontline crisis workers to our management and leadership team as well, of our, as well as our board of directors have lived experience themselves of mental health or substance use needs. I would say currently we are probably upwards of 50% of our, of our staff and board. Next slide, please. Okay, I'll be very quick. So just to give you a quick set of some, some of the work that we're doing now, is really centered on crisis intervention and de-escalation, mental health and substance use distress, barriers to the social determinants of health, and isolation, detachment from supports and loneliness. Marginalization is a key feature of most of the people that we see. Whether people are housed or unhoused, experience of mental health is often extremely isolating and disconnecting, and it, it really is so important to have that connection and, and to be able to speak to somebody that someone's experience. Could move through to the, to the last uh, slide, if you don't mind, I'll just speed it along. I'll give you a sense of recent achievements. So Gerstein Centre, uh, we are one of four anchor partners in the four, first six months since the, the project began. We have responded to more than 850 crisis calls in the community, only a very, very small fraction of which have resulted in the need to engage emergency services. We began running 24-6 and have been 24-7 as of September. We also have a partnership with Family Services of Toronto who can offer people uh, six free sessions of short-term psychotherapy through that partnership and a partner with Toronto Public Health and they're able to provide harm reduction supplies and walk zone training within the community. We continue to get and strive to, to really check in with the community and get their feedback. The food feedback has been very positive highlighting not just the success of the project, but reinforcing the community's uh, support and desire for community-based alternatives to police and hospital interventions for crisis. That's it. Thank you so much.
Thank you very much, Elaine. Um, we wanted you to hear in detail about the uh, Toronto Community Crisis Service. It's so important. Um, before I call on our next speaker, I've been informed that some people online were having audio difficulties, so they couldn't hear the opening remarks, and they have requested that I make those remarks a second time. So with your indulgence, I'll repeat what I said before. By way of housekeeping, those of you who are online will be able to submit questions to the event organizers who are available to you. We are holding this event and broadcasting from indigenous land. Toronto is part of the dish with one spoon territory. This is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Mississaugas that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. The dish symbolizes the land we live on and benefit from. The single spoon symbolizes caring for the land so there is enough for all. Colonization and land theft is the context for the disproportionate levels of homelessness, violence, and policing experienced by indigenous people in Toronto. This includes policing of indigenous people on TTC, who are three times more likely to have an interaction with transit enforcement than white people. Black people are two times more likely than white people to have such interactions. Concerns about safety from transit users and transit workers are not new. That's why we are holding tonight's event. We'll hear from eight wonderful speakers who have ideas to share about how to create a safer city and TTC for everyone in the long term. And who have seen, who have been raising safety concerns for some time. Everything from the rise of anti-Asian racism during the pandemic to the insurmountable accessibility barriers that poor snow and ice clearing cause for bus riders, especially in suburban areas. After we hear from our speakers, we'll have time for some questions. And finally, we'll spend time speaking with each other about what a safer TTC means to you and your community. Recent media reports have created the impression of a big spike in violent incidents on the TTC. But without TTC data publicly available from December 2022 and January 2023, it is not yet clear Oh, maybe I can tape it afterwards and you can attach it to the... <laughs> All right, so, but without TTC data, publicly available from December 2022 and January 2023, it is not yet clear if there has indeed been a significant increase in the last two months or simply more media attention. The number of recorded offenses against TTC users actually decreased from October 2022 to November 2022, from 2.11 offenses per million boardings to 1.91 offenses per million boardings. We all deserve serious evidence-based solutions that will create a safer city and TTC for everyone in the long term. Mayor John Tory has not provided any evidence 
that his decision to expand police and security guards on the TTC will prevent violence. But there is plenty of evidence that this approach will make some transit users less safe, especially black, indigenous, and unhoused people, and people in mental health crisis. There is also no public data that shows unhoused people or people with mental illnesses are responsible for recent violence on transit. But the only supportive staff Mayor Tory has invested in on the TTC are 10 streets to homes workers and 20 community safety ambassadors whose mandate is to work with people experiencing homelessness. Mayor Tory has not yet shared how much all of his newly announced security measures will cost and where the funding will come from. But city staff revealed this week at a council meeting that paying for 80 police officers over time will cost $1.7 million per month. In contrast, warm 24-7 shelter for 212 people would cost approximately the same, that is $1.69 million per month. The City Council budget vote on February 15 is an opportunity to invest in the community supports to build a safer city for all of us. Now I'll move to our... Thank you. So our next speaker is Tima Shah president of Centennial College Students Association. CCSAI is generously hosting tonight's event at Centennial College Progress Camp Campus, and student leaders have been speaking up in the last month against TTC service cuts and fare increases. And I should say that the speakers who are coming now will be speaking for approximately three minutes each. Tima. Hello, um, we're good with audio? Um, hi, I am Tima. I am the president of Centennial College Student Association. We represent more than 20,000 students across five campuses all over Toronto, and two of our biggest campuses are here in Scarborough. This is one of them. A safe TTC for us means that buses, are, buses and transit vehicles are arriving on time and that students are able to get to and from school and connect with community resources reliably and safely. If you look at uh, our, if you look at any of the buildings right now, we have students in the buildings right now. Classes at Centennial sometimes are running up until 10 p.m. Uh, or longer, and we need students who are here on classes late at night to be able to go home safely. We don't want students to be waiting for buses late at night for long periods of time. A safe TTC means that students who are uh, taking groceries or students who have disabilities are able to comfortably get on buses and on transit vehicles. It means they're not forced to climb into crowded vehicles where they're being shoved or pushed and they're not safe. We know from TTC data that the service cuts to TTC, the off-peak service cuts, uh, impact people uh, impact lower income, impact females, impact uh, people who are working late shifts, uh, and impact racialized people the most. And that demographic represents so many of us. We know that uh, Centennial historically has had the highest uptake of OSAP users within the GTA uh, and much higher than the provincial average. Uh, we know that a lot of our students are, are parents who are juggling, taking care of their families along with classes. A lot of our students are relying on part-time jobs and often their jobs are late at night or even working at night shift. And all of these students, all of us, we need proper transit that is funded and that is sustainable in order to help us successfully complete our education and successfully become part of the community and contribute to the community. We also know from TTC's data, um, 
sorry, we also know from data that the healthiest and the happiest communities are the ones where uh, public and social services are adequately funded, and we want to ensure that transit is adequately funded so that our students and transit users are not just surviving in the community, they are able to thrive in the community. So we want properly funded transit for all of us. Thank you very much, Tima. Our next speaker is joining us online. Please welcome Devika Prasad, representing the Women Abuse Council of Toronto, an organization that works to eradicate gender-based violence. Devika? of technology. You need the audio. Try this again. Please let me know if the sound cuts off and you can't hear me. Um, but my name is Tadika. I am from the Women Abuse Council of Toronto. We are a nonprofit organization that works to eradicate gender based violence through research, education, and advocacy. Gender based violence intersects with everything housing, employment, and in this case, it intersects with transit. We know that public transit is a gender issue. Women make up the majority of public transit riders in Toronto and are often subject to harassment, intimidation, and violence while riding transit or waiting at transit stops. We know that women are more likely to use public transit due to affordability and are more like and are more often traveling with children. We also know that women frequently travel during off-peak hours and rely on dependable frequent services. Safety concerns on transit, safety concerns for transit users are not new. In our study with Angus Reed Group in 2002, we found that 86% of transit riders in Toronto experienced some form of harassment and it was more common among women to have experienced sexual harassment with 59% compared to 22% of men. Women shared that they were often on high alert, used their phone to avoid unwanted attention, traveled with others, and some decided not to take trips at all and stay home to avoid harassment and feeling unsafe. As we know, public transit is critical for people's mobility and livelihood, so it's important that we work together to make transit safe and accessible. A safer transit system, to me, looks like a gender-responsive transit system that is trauma-informed and based on, on evidence, one that invests in community supports and is community-led. Thank you so much. Center for Independent Living Toronto, and David will also join us online. David? Toronto. I'm honored to be here to speak with these uh, wonderful 
uh, advocates for a safe transit. So what does a safe TTC mean to the over 400,000 people with disabilities who live in this city? First of all, it means your transit accessibility needs are prioritized in safety planning. It means a safe, accessible, affordable transit system that every day disabled riders trust to get them to work, school, medical appointments, and play. It means a TTC that arrives on time and reliable, accessible vehicles and subways that's accessible to the needs. That doesn't cut service by 9% in this year's budget. Put longer wait times, more overcrowding, increased risk of injury, illness, and abuse for folks who currently don't experience TTC is very accessible. A safe TTC appreciates the riders from other equity seeking groups are disproportionately disabled due to systemic inequities in our society. This includes disabled BIPOC, queer, trans, and other low income communities, and yes, and house people, many of whom acquire disabilities because of their harsh living circumstances. So our customer service on the TTC needs to be anti racist, anti transphobic. Would not have security stop for police riders based on identity bias? Many unhoused folks uh, are forced to use the TTC as shelter because our city's chosen not to invest in affordable housing. And just this week, even warming centers, they normal save lives this winter. So safety TTC for unhoused folks is a welcoming place that gets them to shelters, gets them to an encampment tent that they call home, it's a lifeline. A safety TTC means racialized folks with mental health disabilities who are experiencing crisis don't face harm by being policed and criminalized on transit. It means a much safer place than it now is for folks and who would be better served through mental health crisis teams trained in de-escalation as opposed to the security and TPS responses the city's recently approved as a band-aid. A safe TCC for disabled people means an affordable one. Most people with disabilities live in legislated poverty, as we all know. By choosing transit fares this year and expanding the fare pass program, city council can make disabled lives safer this year. You'll have more funds in your wallet to support essentials such as food, medicine, clothing, and community. A safe TCC is one whose accessible transit due to real trans. Some you may not be aware of, uh, Wheel Trans is a program, has a family service program that's being scaled up uh, to make people who are currently on the transit face being put onto the conventional transit for all or part of their rides. It's a pretty uh, terrifying uh, concern for folks who really depend on Wheel Trans to get them to the city safely. What's this going to do at a time when the CDC is divesting its service and cutting back on its services? It means that more and more people using wheelchairs, scooters, walkers, would be forced onto buses and streetcars to get around in their communities. It means uh, more overcrowding on buses, more safety with falls, more safety with abuse by other passengers, uh, and it puts really people with disabilities and seniors with a greater risk of harm at a time when really we need to be making the PTC more accessible and actually achieving its, its goal of full accessibility by 2025. Currently, a lot of subways are still not accessible to folks. So being put on transit, regular transit means for a lot of folks that it's going to be actually making the TTC a more safe place for them. So in closing, I want to just state that uh, we share a lot of what a lot of the other folks here are going to speak about today. Um, Having a safe, accessible, inclusive, affordable transit is critical at this time in us, our community. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Uh, before I call on our next speaker, just uh, uh, an invitation to all of you who are attending this event. If you are posting any thoughts or ideas about say for TTC on your social media platforms, please uh, 
use the hashtag PTC for all. I encourage you to do that. Our next speaker is somebody we have all got to know a bit from recent news stories. Um, Marvin Alfred, president of ATU Local 113, representing nearly 12,000 public transit workers in Toronto and New York region. Marvin. Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for the introduction. I do represent 12,000 transit workers, but 12,000 transit workers are very frustrated at what's going on in transit right now. It's a shame with what's happening in transit. The city, the province, have allowed the TTC, amongst, another, amongst other things, become part of the shelter network. We have a situation right now where the TTC and the city have denied the resources for people that need housing, that need uh, care and mental illness treatment, and allowed the transit system to be part of that shelter network. We want that to be addressed. We want the people that get to get the dignity and respect in transit to not need transit as their housing. We want the city, right now, I think with all the media attention that's happening right now with all the high-profile incidents, we have an opportunity to have them be held accountable. The only reason that they're doing all these things they're doing right now, regarding the policing and all these resources being thrown into transit, is political optics, in my opinion, my humble opinion. Right now, you have an opportunity to confront your city councilor, confront your MPP, your MP, to get them to address what you need to be done regarding transit. Because if it doesn't happen, when the cameras are off, it's going to be back to the same old, same old. You have this opportunity to address it, whether you're a student, whether you're a parent, to address the people that you pay for to represent you, to actually represent you. And now is the time to actually get them to act. Because we have national attention on what's going on with Toronto Transit, and we need these things to be addressed ASAP. Again, I told you that we're representing 12,000 transit workers. We're the eyes and ears of the system. And we've been trying for years, for decades, in order to get things addressed. We put in reports, we put in issues and hazards for the TTC to, ad TTC to address it, but unfortunately it's not being addressed. Not until there's a national attention or some tragedy that occurs, they're going to address it. We as transit workers want transit riders to feel safe and secure in operating because without you, we don't have an opportunity to work. And we want the system to be perceived as safe. We want the system to have people be, feel encouraged to put their families on there. I know I've been in the media for a few times the last couple of weeks, but I've had off, off camera a couple of journalists tell me that they're concerned about transit for their own families. That's a tragedy in itself that you have a prominent journalist that's afraid of you, sorry, has concerns using transit themselves. This is what we need to address right now. As a transit worker, I've been on the job for over 21 years, whether it is in the union or not, and I can tell you that this is an atmosphere that we've never experienced before, and I think it needs to be addressed. I think with the, we've called out to the federal government, the uh, municipal government, and the provincial government. Right over there, give a shout out to my political action group right there. Please everybody give a hand for political action. Very good, thank you. We've met with city councilors, we've met with provincial MPPs, and we've met with the federal government to try and get resources put into transit because it's needed. It's needed in order to help people, we need it in order to help service. Because money that is being touted going into transit is not necessarily going to service. That's where we need better, you know, more reliable service for people to take uh, transit and know it's going to be available to them. They're cutting service, which is disappointing. How are you going to encourage people to return to transit that's not there? You need service to be inflated, not deflated. You want people to know that that bus is going to be there, that streetcar, that subway is going to be there on a reliable basis to return to transit. People are not going to return to transit if there's overcrowding. People are not going to return to transit if they're not going to have a, you know, a genuine way to get home. We want these things to be addressed. Other things that are issues in transit right now, in my opinion, they're cutting jobs and opportunities for people to start in the TTC. They talk about opportunities for onboarding, you know, people to move up in society, yet they're getting rid of jobs. They're contracting out jobs, they're getting rid of opportunities. We've had situations where, unfortunately, you had somebody who was stabbed recently in, in transit. And the first person that was on the scene to help comfort that person and try to save their life was a guard. That's a job that is trying to get rid of right now. We had somebody, unfortunately, set on fire last year. The first person on the scene, between whether it's a guard or a collector, these are jobs that TTC is trying to get rid of. We had somebody uh, not too long ago that was a four-year-old child that was between uh, stations on track level, and it was a guard, a job they're trying to get rid of, that they were, that was the first person on scene to save that person's life. The person that rolled under the subway that was pushed onto track level and had to roll under the platform to avoid a train coming onto them, that person that was giving them comfort had to offload the platform in order to give comfort to people and stabilize the platform and actually speak to the person that was injured underneath track level was a guard, the job they're trying to get rid of. 
there are systemic problems with the TTC. I'm sorry, I'm going to go on in three minutes. There, there's a systemic problem with the TTC, and we want these issues to be addressed because we need resources to be put into the system in order to have that safe, dependable system for everybody to utilize. We want transit to be reliable for transit riders, for transit workers, and safe for everybody. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Marvin. Um, one thought that crossed my mind from your examples is that these were people, the guards and the operators who jumped to save or protect people, were on the scene. The police officers and TTC special constables will not be on the scene. They will come after the fact. How does that increase safety? Um, our next speaker is Lauren Lam, who is an outreach worker and case manager who organizes with the Shelter Housing Justice Network. Lauren? My name is Lorraine and I'm here um, wearing a hat as a transit rider most of the time. Actually, I would say half of the time because the other half of the time I'm cycling, but we all know cycling in Toronto's winter is like oh, sometimes a death sentence. So I am uh, a big fan of transit in Toronto. Um, I'm also here as an outreach worker and I work in the downtown east in Toronto working with people who are unhoused and precariously housed. I'm here today, frankly, still really angry and really upset about yesterday's council votes about um, opening warming centers 24-7. You know, the city uses the language around safety, and yet they voted against the bare minimum of supports for people who actually really need safety and lack safety. And so today we're talking about safety on public transit. And my approach is, instead of saying this is what safety is, I think I often frame this conversation as four questions. Whose safety are we talking about? What is safety? Who's the public that we're talking about? And where do people go? Um, Jane, we're calling her Jane for tonight. Jane is someone that I've worked with for the last couple of years. She's an older woman, always walking around downtown with a bundle buggy, a few large bags, always looks a little disheveled, but she always has a portable, foldable chair with her. Now it sounds kind of ludicrous that like this homeless woman would have a chair with her, but she says it's because she never knows where she's going to be able to sit down. She had some health issues, had no housing, and her home was either Union Station or the Queen Street car overnight. And if I'm very honest, there were some nights where I gave her Presto tickets as an, op as an option to find more, and a tips card to access the Tim Hortons on York Street, because there were no other options. We would spend hours on the phone on central intake trying to find something and nothing would be available. I would backdoor and try to call managers at shelters that I knew to plead for a spot. And they said, I really want to help you, but there is nothing available. Jane never took her shoes off because she was worried they would get stolen. She saved food from wherever she could go because she worried about being hungry. And she also actually never had hours of consecutive sleep lying down. And we know that sleep deprivation is actually used as a form of torture. And so here we are with hundreds and hundreds of people who are unhoused, with nowhere to go, who rely on whatever options they can find to try to catch maybe a 20 minute power nap from one end of Queen to the other. Transit, uh, transit systems, coffee shops, libraries, these are not drop-in and respite centers. They're not equipped to be so, but we live in a city right now who has made active decisions to actually slash drop-in funding to not open warming centers, and so people are trying to just survive. According to 2021 Toronto Street Needs Assessment data, there are over 700 people who sleep outside, and we know that that is an undercount. That number has definitely gone up. All of these people live variations of Jane's reality. No access to food, water, housing, sleep, they risk freezing to death in the middle of winter, and the city just voted against warming centers. And so when we're talking about safety, for me, safety is about stability. Having access to the most basic needs for survival. On a day like today, has anyone been outside? I tried to ride my bike earlier, what a mistake. Yeah, I know, right? So silly. 
It was insane out there. And you know what? The city closed warming centers midday yesterday because it wasn't cold enough. Even though the forecast showed that we were going to have 24 hours of cold, wet rain and people would have nowhere to go. Today at King Station, I witnessed someone who was actually unhoused and he was on transit and two cops came and kicked him off and gave him a ticket. And you know what he said to them? He said, I'm just trying to get to the warming center. Poor guy, firstly, the warming centers are closed. Secondly, he was using public transit like the rest of us to try to get from point A to point B and the cops decided that he was not allowed. So the question then is, whose public are we really concerned about? Who is, like, who's considered public? Whose safety are we concerned about? Because this vulnerable man was told to get off the subway even though he was just trying to get warm and dry. The city says that there's no money to offer resources, but yet they seem to be able to find millions of dollars right away to add cops everywhere. Just found it. At uh, city council meetings this week, um, the city said that it would cost $1.8 million a month to fund 80 cops working overtime on transit, when one warming center would only cost $400,000. <laughs> Whose safety is being prioritized here? In addition, I have a problem with the conflation between violence on transit and with unhoused people. Because if we watch a lot of the mainstream media coverage that we've seen these days, an example is on January 19th on Global, the news reports would say, hey, there was a violent incident on transit. And then the next clip would show Rick Leary or the mayor say something about, like, that's why we need streets to homes workers to work with unhoused people. These kind of negative stereotypes perpetuate really violent attitudes towards unhoused people, and I think we need to challenge that. Frankly, a number of the incidences of violences that we've heard on, the, on TTC were committed by house teenagers. I'm not going to scapegoat teenagers, but I think we need to actually stop scapegoating poor and unhoused people for all causes of violence on transit. Also, police don't deal with mental health issues, and we witnessed that actually a number of racialized members of our community who were in distress were actually killed at the hands of cops. Meanwhile, me, my coworkers, my team that I've worked with, we have actually de-escalated so many situations of violence without guns, without tasers. We've taken guns, uh, we've taken knives out of people's hands, we've stopped fights simply with a cigarette and a lovely conversation. What is a cop going to do? If this is about mental health, why are we putting money into policing and not actual mental health supports? <laughs> Whose safety are we talking about here? And which public gets to take up space? That said, I think that we need to address the fact that there are people who might be feeling scared on transit. And I think there is space for fear, and I think there is space for discomfort. But fear can protect us. And I think the fear is an invitation for us to ask some different questions. What are we so afraid of? Is it about unpredictability? Is it because we feel unequipped to respond to crises? Is it because we've never talked to a homeless person before and we're scared we'll say the wrong thing? How can we position ourselves with our fear to learn instead of villainizing the other? Is our fear actually more just about our discomfort? Maybe we say we're scared, but maybe we're actually just uncomfortable being forced right up, the human, right up against the humanity of someone who is so different from us. Can we learn to actually see the humanity in each other? Can we learn de-escalation skills? Can we train each other? Can we do overdose responses together? Whose safety are we actually really concerned about? And which public deserves to take up space? And where are people supposed to go? Jane died last year, and I hope that in our conversations around transit and safety, we honor Jane and all of the people who are Janes in our society. Thank you. Thank you, Lorian. That was a very important question. Whose safety are we talking about, and who are the public? Our final speaker, is Butterfly Sabrina Gopal, and she's joining us from Jane Finch Action Against Poverty. Please welcome Butterfly. Hi, good evening, everyone. How are you all doing? How are you all doing? Whose services? Whose services? budgets uh, this year. Uh, we see, we 
know the budgets, we know the breakdowns, we know where the dollars should be going, but the, you know, our city continues to go straight ahead with funding more policing. Uh, many people in the city are suffering, right? Particular, and, and we've heard from our speakers tonight. Um, my friend, I so connect with so much of what my sister just said. I've been a frontline worker uh, in the Jane and Finch Black Creek for over 20 years, and now I'm in Parkdale. Two different, unique, beautiful communities, but struggling in such similar, chronic, structural, systemic ways. And constantly uh, criminalized, demonizing, working poor, black, racialized, LGBTQ plus communities, homeless communities, um, instead of really putting where dollars need to go. Uh, we saw John uh, Tory's leadership with the support of his silent counselors. Um, and they've done nothing fundamentally to improve our lives. Our communities have been relying on our own strengths for decades. Community care, mutual care, this has been going on in the hood for decades. Um, what has the city officials done for us? Sensationalizing issues related uh, to safety and justifying more policing? Do you know what happens in our neighborhoods? Do you know what happens when we engage with the police? We're seeing them more on the streets, we're seeing them more on the campuses, just criminalizing us. They've done this in relation to the incidents that have been happening on TTC and for sure they're scary. But they have been constantly happening. They have been happening. Instead of you know putting in our workers instead of the cuts that we're seeing in this public service, Instead of funding these amazing resources that have been doing this work historically in the city of Toronto, they continue to cut and the police budget is over $1.2 billion. We care about safety as well uh, and the well-being of folks on TTC, but what are the ne what, what needs um, is, 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 do we need to focus on collectively? We see that there's no um, dollars being put into 24-hour warming centers, something that the city shamely opposed. And we, and we need to cut the police budget in half and start investing these dollars into housing, uh, support, it, uh, support services across the city. We need extensive and visible mental health uh, service workers. We need more community-oriented training uh, for, for all of our uh, uh, TTC employees and stop hiring teachers jobs. We need to pressure all, yes, we need to stop hiring them. Right, they're, they're on our transit systems, they're in our malls, they're, they're everywhere, right? But what have they been doing? Terrorizing, criminalizing our communities? Do you know how much these tickets are? Do we all know? When you get ticketed, it's $425, okay? This is working poor communities getting ticketed when they're trying to work three, four jobs, taking care of their families, making sure there's food on the table, and then they get this ticket on a public transit, $425. You have to lose a day of work, possibly lose your job. We don't know where all those dollars are going. And it's business as usual in the city of Toronto. Uh, we need to avoid uh, sensationalizing and propaganda by, by these uh, favoring of low income and uh, ordering approaches and look at, look at the issues of safety holistically, which includes the fight against violence and poverty, the police brutality and strengthening our socioeconomic safety nets and programs and services, stigma against unhoused folks, racism against indigenous, black and other racialized communities, are a major part of the discussion about safety. We strongly oppose any cuts to TTC service. We strongly oppose fair hikes and, and, and any of the cuts that are happening of our services across the northwest and northeast parts of the city. And defund the police, free transit, and invest in our communities now. Thank you. some very powerful and uh, critical questions being asked by our speakers. So thank you all. Um, looking at the time, I think 
um, we need to not have a Q&A session and go into uh, conversations at our tables and in our breakout rooms for those who are online. But before we do that, uh, there are a couple of announcements, short one minute announcements uh, that I'd like you to hear. The first one is from Sean Mahar, um, speaking for uh, the Reach Out Response Network. Um, these are announcements to suggest some ways that you can take action. Sean? Thank you, Alok. I'm Sean Maher. I'm the chair of the board of the Reach Out Response Network, which was one of the first advocates for an alternative non-police response to mental health crises. And I'm here to share our call to action, which is simple. Let's have a balanced investment in public safety. If there's $48 million in the budget for new safety initiatives, let's spend at least half of that on non-police interventions. The current non-police mental health crises pilots that you heard about earlier have been evaluated, and they're doing incredibly well in every way but one. They serve only half the city. And the other half of us have to rely on the police when there's a mental health crisis. Investing and expanding these programs is better in literally every way. It produces better outcomes. People in a mental health crisis benefit from mental health care, not from justice system interventions. It's safer. Only 11% of 911 calls to the police involving mental health involve any violence at all. And even the US Association of Chiefs of Police agrees sending uniformed armed staff into those situations that need de-escalation makes things worse, not better. Which is why non-police interventions all across North America have far lower injury rates than um, any model that involves the police. It's also a lot more efficient, whether you care about the well-being of the person in crisis, the cost to the taxpayer, or the impact on police response times. All of those things are better served by alternative crisis response. Non-police interventions cost about half as much as hiring police, so you get twice as many people uh, getting support. You have twice as much bang for your buck. You have twice as many police freed up to respond to anyone who wants them to come if you focus your dollars on alternatives. So Roran is asking that at least half the money that goes to safety in this budget be spent on the things that actually work. You can support that by going to the Reach Out Response Network webpage, Twitter account, or Instagram, or Facebook, and we have links there to connect you to ways to write to the mayor and ask for a balanced model. Thank you. The, another announcement, this one is from uh, TTC Riders. Um, This announcement will only take 30 seconds because we're running out of time, but we've all heard from speakers who've made the case for more investment in strong public services like transit, like 24-7 warm space. So I just invite everyone here to go to ttcriders.ca, go to progresstoronto.ca, and take action for those investments before council votes on February 15th. There's also a rally at City Hall on the morning of February 15th to call for the investments we need in a safer city. And I'll leave it to Alok to open the breakout rooms now or at your tables, our discussion. Thank you, Sheila. Um, so now we'll, um, you'll have an opportunity to spend about 15 minutes in your groups, breakout rooms for those who are online and uh, at your tables here, those of you who are here. What does a safer TTC mean for you and your community? Uh, we have heard people, speakers saying, who are the people? Whose safety are we talking about? We have heard the call for evidence-based answers. We have called for a national strategy. We have heard about the difference that those who were on site made versus those who came after the incident had already happened. So, what does a safer TDC mean for you and your community? Please take 15 minutes and speak to each other online and in this room. I believe there are facilitators who will be taking notes um, at the tables 
and also for the breakout rooms. Those who are going on the breakout rooms and who need ASL interpretation, please stay in the main room. Don't leave the main room. There will be ASL interpreters for those of you who need ASL interpretation. Stay in the main uh, room. And we'll take about 15 minutes to talk to each other. At the end of tonight, PTC riders, the organizers, will summarize our conversation, both what our panelists said and what you say, and look for that summary. Thank you. So 15 minutes for conversations among yourselves.